I forget the exact calculation, but I think our cameras that we have installed and sold generate more video every day than everything you can find on YouTube and Netflix. So Dude, just to give that's... a percep <laughs> perception of the amount of video, right? 30 frames a second, 4K, 100 cameras in a store, do a quick calculation. I mean, terabytes is nothing. We eat it up like, like nothing if you want to store it longer. It's amazing to consider the amount of data one security camera is responsible for when it's capturing and storing every single second, 30 frames a second, every hour of the day, and it's doing it in 4K definition. The ability of Access Communications to capture and store that data for its customers gives them an upper hand in securing their assets and communities. Did you know, fun factoid, Access Communication actually uploads and stores more data on a daily basis than YouTube. Frederick Nielsen, VP of Americas at Access Communications, outlines some of the ways the company's technology helps safeguard nature, our businesses, and our homes on today's episode of IT Visionaries. Thanks for listening to our communication series here. If you missed our episodes with Comcast, Zayo, and Phoenix Real-Time Solutions and others, check out the description below. We have links to the other episodes. IT Visionaries is powered by Salesforce Platform. If this episode makes you want to go deeper into the data security world, check out salesforce.com slash data security and download the IT guide to data security and governance to learn how to protect your customer data with Salesforce security portfolio. Welcome everyone to another episode of IT Visionaries. And today we have the VP of America's at Axis Communications, Frederick Nielsen. Frederick, welcome to the show. Thanks, Albert. It's great to be here. Great to be here. Listen, for those of you that don't know, Axis Communications is a, is a comms company, but they kind of have a specialty in uh, security. And we're going to dive into all this. It's a little bit different from other comms companies that you might have heard of. But before we dive into it, we got to get to know Frederick a little better. It's time for the lightning round. The lightning round is brought to us by Salesforce Platform, the number one cloud platform for digital transformation of every experience. Frederick, this is where we ask you questions outside of the realm of work so our audience can get to know you a little better. You ready? Great. All right. We did a little homework on you and found out that you're a golfer and a skier. Is that accurate? That is correct. That is correct. Which one are you better at? Which one am I better at? Um, probably golfing, and that doesn't say anything. I'm a reasonable skier, but I have two sons that are crazy skiers and a wife who grew up in Switzerland who's a real good skier in the family. So <laughs> I'm at the bottom of that barrel. So I pick golfing. <laughs> I like that. I'm imagining you and your, your sons and your wife and... They're, you know, waiting for dad at the bottom of the hill. Waiting for dad, carrying the skis. When they do the, the dangerous runs, I carry the skis down. And, you know, <laughs> I'm still a decent skier, so. You also, we also did a homework. It sounds like you are a musician and you play guitar. Is that accurate? That is correct. That is correct. I do play guitar and I'm going to play with my little uh, amateur band. Actually, there's a couple of good musicians and then there's a couple of hangarounds that play with them tomorrow night, uh, next time. Oh, what style of music do you play? All kind of covers and rock. You call it the jam session, backyard jam session. So anyone can join. It can might be anything from eight to 15 musicians. And we just have a good time and play some songs that most people know. Okay, that's cool. A lot of covers and stuff like that. What or who yeah. inspired you to pick up a guitar? My father, because he t told me the best instrument that he always wanted to play was the clarinet. And I tried it for a year and it was horrible, <laughs> sounded horrible. And I thought it was so boring. And then I said, he, said, he told me, you got to play an instrument. And then a close friend started to play the guitar. I said, how about I pick the guitar just to get out of the clarinet so I can thank my father for my guitar uh, interest for the guitar. Hey, listen, I'm a guitarist myself. I like to say that I love guitar, but I'm terrible at it. Uh, but you don't have to be good to enjoy your hobbies. I got to ask, who's a musician that or a guitarist you really look up to, like you wish you could play like? It's, there's a lot of good guitarists. I, you know, Jimmy Page from Led Zeppelin, of course, uh, <laughs> Jimi Hendrix, all those classic, real good guitars. I love the solos of David Gilmour of uh, Pink Floyd as well. So... Uh, as you hear, I, I kind of date and age myself a little bit, but that's the kind of music I listen to. Hey, listen, um, I am from, you know, 1980 is when I was born, but I'm pretty sure everyone, even today, who picks a guitar, Jimi Hendrix plays a role in that. Like when you hear yeah. him play, you're like, damn, like, I want to learn how to do that. We all want to be playing like him. So we have a long way to go. <laughs> yeah, I'm not anywhere close either. Mm. Uh, well, Frederick, I appreciate you sharing a little bit about yourself, you know, one of the things that we always want to do after, you know, we want to get to know you, want to understand a little bit about your background, because you work in an industry that is really fascinating. Uh, as our listeners know, if you're listening to this now, we've been part of our communication series, meeting with different companies that help, our, you know, bringing media to life in sports, entertainment, communications. 
but Axis plays in a different place. It's using the same or similar field where we're using the internet to move images, data, communications, but you guys are focusing specifically on security. And I want everyone to hear, because I want to start off with a news article. Access Communication just put out that they their surveillance cameras were played a big role in stopping wildfires. Let's start there, because that's pretty fascinating. First, tell us what Access does, and then explain how can a camera help stop a wildfire? Give us an idea of how this works. Yeah. So, so Axis is a company that's been in business for around 30 plus years uh, and was founded as a networking company. And by the mid 90s, we became an IoT company, which today everyone knows what IoT is. But back yeah. in the mid 90s, a lot of people don't, didn't necessarily know what it was all about. And at that point in 1996, we invented and launched the world's first IP based camera that could be used for many things. One of them was security. Another one was surveillance, which is more the application you mentioned here on, on wildfires. And uh, since then, we've grown that business to become a last year, I think it was around one point three billion dollar global 4000 people in the company and the global leader and also especially here in the Americas, the leader in security and surveillance for all kinds of applications. Yeah, so security and surveillance, and give us an idea of what that means. So like, how are these companies deploying access, I guess? I'm assuming it's on a closed network or is it on a shared public network? I'm assuming it's closed. Both. One of the benefits doing surveillance over an IP-based network is the scalability. As long as you have a network drop, you can add a camera there. In, in the old times, you have to have a point-to-point -point cable, a coaxial cable from the camera all the way to the recording device. And that's rarely available in a building and quite expensive to kind of pull all that cabling. Oh, yeah. But with IP based cameras, you can kind of put a camera anywhere and really scale the system from one camera to thousands, like one camera at a time. So, if you think how is security uh, surveillance being used today, once you're in this industry, and I'm going to challenge you, Albert, to start doing that, look around and see when you can find the next access camera and send me a picture, because uh, you're going to realize they're absolutely everywhere. But they're kind of playing a very subtle role, and most people don't think about it and shouldn't think about it. It's just there to provide sort of security. So if you go to schools, is a big user of security uh, cameras, uh, retail stores, banks, government, airports, uh, casinos to some extent, people see. But you also see it in every kind of scenario uh, out and about, even toll booths for cars and things like that. And it really comes down to automating and digitizing information instead of having people there or guards uh, taking care of the security and surveillance and, and making it a little bit more reliable and sustainable as well. Yeah, give us an idea of the importance and the, the changes in telecom communications have helped access and how you guys have rode the wave because you know, we've had a lot of people on our show that are in communications, but they're more about, it's more about entertainment. I mean, honestly, it's it's a lot of it's more about entertainment. And so if there's a blip or a slowdown, like, yeah, it's kind of frustrating for me to watch TV and not see, you know, you know, seeing a laggy performance on my favorite sporting event. But what you guys are dealing with is much more serious. Talk about how, like, how do you guys maintain performance standards? Talk about, like, what kind of things did you guys have to do to make sure, because I'm, I'm pretty confident some of the things that you protect like the surveillance can't, I mean, just can't go down. Just, it, it's not, it's not a telecom broadcast. It, it, this stuff cannot go down. It, no, exactly. No, it's a good, and, and the interesting thing, if you start reusing many of the same technologies, so HDTV kind of resolution or 4K that you have on your home TV that has driven people to want to have the same for security and surveillance and, you know, compression wise, H265 and so forth. The difference when it comes to performance here and bandwidth, if we start with that, is yeah. that in the media world, if you compress a movie or so forth, or maybe even a live sporting event where you can allow a little bit of a lag, 10, 5, 10 seconds lag, you have more opportunity to compress the video before you launch it out on the network. Okay. When it comes to live security surveillance, you have less than half a second or you know, 0.1 second to compress it and send it over because you want to have live video and, and live surveillance over it. When it comes to a uh, requirement on the system, you said, is it a lot on the public networks and yeah. streaming over or is it more a local network? And I said, it's really both. If you look at a typical store, they want to have it there locally for local investigations, but they also have remote investigation centers for what's happening in the stores where they want to transfer the video either live uh, or recorded video after the fact as well. Often on an internal network, but not rarely via some kind of VPN or some kind of technology over public network as well to transmit the video. 
And as performance of networks increase and the size of the storage array increase, we'll use it all. We have no issues with that. <laughs> I forget the exact calculation, but I think our cameras that we have installed and sold generate more video every day than everything you can find on YouTube and Netflix. So Dude, just to give that's... it perspective. <laughs> Perception of the amount of video, right? 30 yeah. frames a second, 4K, 100 cameras in a store, do a quick calculation. I mean, terabytes is nothing. We eat it up like, like nothing if you want to store it longer. And a lot of customers for a long time said, you know, 10 frames a second is fine, but if they can get 30 or 60, they would like that. Uh, 1080p was fine, but they, if they can get 4K, it's fine. Uh, retention one week is fine, but if I can get 180 days, which have in some government application, I want to have that as well. So we can eat up a lot. And that's really where we benefit from all the developments in the IT industry and pushing the boundaries and making it better and faster. Uh, our systems are becoming better and better and better for the end customers all the time based on that. So we thank all those companies for driving those boundaries uh, every single day. Listen, we got to put that in our intro because that is a bananas stat. You know, when people hear about how much video is created or published to YouTube in a given, you know, day, everyone's always mind is blown. So it's like access does even more, which is I can see yeah. it now Like you take that multiplier effect. You know, tell us a little bit about how and what features or f like actual security measures that this is unlocking. We should start with that fire because that's pretty fascinating stuff. You know, this is something that, you know, when we were before we started recording, we talked about, hey, the old way of detecting a wildfire was literally by sheer luck. You had helicopters flying around. Yeah. Maybe you got a phone report by somebody driving by. Now we're able to deploy cameras, thermal cameras to actually spot these things. I want to because, I, I, you know, I love these examples because Frederick, like the what you guys are doing is amazing, but I want our audience to understand what this is unlocking because, you know, a lot of us think of security as, oh, we're just looking at, it's a picture of my, you know, a parking lot. Like, who cares? You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like how many bad things happen? It's not really that important, but like this is like magnitudes of importance because everyone knows, like if, just in this use case, a wildfire, it's easier to contain when it's small. I mean, obviously by the time it gets big, it's a serious problem. Give us an idea yeah. of that and then other things that this network security, this type of this type of communications is really unlocking. So I think one thing that has really happened over the last 20 years plus that we've been in this industry is what I mentioned before. Bandwidth have become more and more plentiful. Storage space have become more and more plentiful. But if you look in the camera, there's kind of two things that happen there. One is the image quality. So in the early days, a camera was barely as good as the human eye to see things. So it was better to have a human standing out there in a tower in the woods <laughs> to look out and see if there's a fire because the camera would be very slow to detect it. Today, because of purpose-built chipsets and, and uh, very small fil filtering of the pictures and picking up of colors, the camera's vision, ability to see things at night is so much better than a human, best, best human eye out there. Uh, we talk about the regular camera and and one thing that is cool today you can see you can see colors out at night so if i put a camera outside of my office here in the middle of the night and i turn on we have a, a functionality called light finder that we've been doing for some 10 years that really improves the image so you can see colors at night you will see a blue sky and you'll ask me like the sky is not blue i said it is in the day and it's also at night you just can't see it but the camera can see that the sky is still blue at night so that's one of the things that have happened and that can be used for all kinds of applications but also for detecting wildfires and see what's going on um, and the other thing that's happened is local intelligence in the cameras to actually analyze the images for yeah. which you need a lot of processing powers as well and some deep learning capabilities today to do it accurately to send the information that Typically, I see a lot of green stuff here in the forest. I see a lot of yellow. You should look <laughs> in this video here because it's not normal. And then on top of that as well, we have what well, you mentioned as well, thermal cameras that look in a different spectrum. They're looking for heat. Uh, if it's far away, it wouldn't necessarily detect it for a wildfire, but as it close up, you can detect it as well. And that's actually used at some of the places where you, where you dump trash, those huge piles you have outside of cities. Yeah, landfills. And it's not unusual that you have fires starting there. You read in the newspaper and once it starts, it takes them weeks to put it out because there's so much trash that's burning. And for that, thermal cameras are heavily used in different applications as well to do that, which could happen any time at night and no one would be there. So basically you automate things, you do it more accurately and you save a lot of time for those kind of fires, which is, which is great to be able to help 
uh, and, and also limit the cost and enhance security for, for society in general. Yeah, that's pretty fascinating that this camera can detect this well before, you know, like we, we said at the top of the show, a helicopter. You're just, just pure luck. If you happen to fly over yeah. the fire, you would spot it and then be able to put it out. But of course... <laughs> that's 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 just pure luck you know you mentioned also the ai component in being able to spot and identify things that maybe the human eye couldn't recognize i remember watching movies you know every movie everyone's seen a good heist movie i think you know someone's stealing mm -hmm. something right and you're in and, and the security guard's always in front of a bank of monitors um and i've been to vegas and i've seen that bank of monitors and i always thought to myself like how do they actually spot anything because no one can look at that many things at one time it's not possible like i can barely no. use two screens i this is my my i was joking before the show started I, this is my first time with having two screens in a while and i can only focus on one thing at a time so like it was i think it was in like oceans 11 or 12 where they gave they made a talk about how it's just it's actually a fallacy like you think that you just think you're secure you're not actually secure because no man or no human can watch all that give us an idea of how ai and machine learning some of the things that you guys are doing are going to change security and surveillance for the better so i when i look at security and surveillance and where it's come from where it's going to go I, I look at three different phases the first one is deterrence which is exactly what you talk about you see a camera and you say, maybe someone is watching it, maybe it's being recorded, yeah. maybe someone can see something, so I better not do it here, I better go to the next casino that have fewer cameras, like you move the crime to somewhere else. And that was a phase of deterrence, you put a camera up, people even have those fake cameras with a sticker under security, and the You're under watch, camera yeah. with a blinking, you know, uh, yeah. red diet, and, and that, that was kind of the deterrence, right? You didn't know if someone was watching. But most people knew that the cameras were pretty bad and you saw the grainy pictures from gas stations, someone stole gas or abducted a child, can't really see what it is. So that was a phase of deterrence. Then you had a phase of forensics where video actually became useful. You can record it digitally, you can search for it. You have, you know, hundreds or thousands of hours of video, but because of some basic intelligence, you can look for at least when there was motion in the parking lot or when there was a yellow car in the parking lot and kind of reduce the number of video to use it forensically in a good way. And also because of the quality of the video, Light Finder I talked about before, uh, and, and get, having good wide dynamic range, you actually see quite closely what it is. You can see the color of your jacket at night when you're walking out and you stole a car. And that was kind of the face of forensics that we're still mostly in today. It's a very useful video. You can find things easily, you can see things, and you can prosecute people, or you can solve crimes or, or, or improve your business with that information. Now when we're looking forward, and, and the whole industry has been looking forward for this for a long, 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 long time, is the face of analytics or proactive security. We can detect things before they happen or as they are happening, so you can alert those security operators in the casino that, you know, look over at door six because something is going on there and then they get all the attention and alert to that. So that really provides for more proactive security as well. And that has to do with built-in analytics, which has really been available on the edge in those systems for 20 years with basic video motion detection. The problem though, and this was also the thing back after 9-11, when a lot of airports says this is unsecure, there's a lot of people on watch list, how do we catch them at the airport? Mm -hmm. And they installed facial recognition. There was a couple of companies, uh, I forget the name of them right now, but they, they were installed in a couple of airports and they said, well, they're 90% accurate. The problem is with 90% accuracy, if you have an airport like here in Boston, Boston Logan with 100,000 people a day, that means you have to extra screen 10,000 people a day. Yeah, and it was yeah. just not valid to do. And the people that are really, the real bad guys, they make sure they have a feature on or an eye patch so you don't detect the face anyway. Yeah, yeah. But that said, today we're getting to a phase, especially with deep learning processing, where the accuracy is going up, where you can relatively accurately detect certain objects, certain faces, certain directions, certain movement to really make it become that proactive surveillance tool that we always want to have had to kind of go into the next phase. Uh, and that's really what's gonna help those operators sitting in front. I've been in the surveillance center in one of the large cities here in the US where they have access to 32,000 cameras. Can you imagine that? Like, <laughs> hey, start with the first thousand before breakfast and then keep on going to the next thousand after lunch. I mean, it's just impossible.
Yeah, yeah, that's impossible. Thirty two thousand, like, dude, you just your mind would just turn into a blur. You wouldn't spot anything. You know, do you th- do you, do you foresee a point in the future? Like, you know, um, obviously current events w- at the time of recording, but the time this show comes out, it's going to be more than thirty days from t- you know the events of the just recently happened in in Texas. Is do you think that it'll ever get to a point where the accuracy was so accurate? So, for example, like how fast can you call a like law enforcement like where the camera did sees a weapon drawn and it knows weapons shouldn't be drawn in public places and it instantly says hey this person has drawn a weapon and like the call is made do you see like reaction times do you forecast that happening in the future some scenarios yes and this very tragic event in in texas the other day i i can't first of all it's really hard to comprehend that it happened and how it happened yeah um but to see videos i think I think for those applications to have policies around schools and, and there is um, some associations we work with that look at how you enter schools and how you exit schools and having those uh, areas with two doors. So if you get through one, you can't get through the other one without someone opening it for you. So you can't force your way into a school and so forth. I think that's what needs to happen. But I think for some applications, uh, security, the, the analytics we have in the cameras today would definitely become a lot more helpful than they are today, whether it's in business operations for doing intelligent things in retail stores uh, or detecting license plates or detecting traffic or seeing congestions on streets and so forth, or detecting people and finding people once a child is abducted and is a, it was a man with, with a yellow coat and you quickly find people with yellow coats and track that through uh, in a smart way. That, that can definitely, that is happening and, and will provide for some real life um, benefits for the society in the future. Yeah. But the school event there, it's it's really hard to see what could have done differently with, with video surveillance and stopping it. One, one of the things when I hear about what you're talking about is technology always drives costs down of former technology. That's, that's typically what happens. And so there's probably getting to the, give us an idea of what's happening because is it, is this allowing more companies or more businesses, more public, you know, public sectors? Is it, is it helping them adopt this type of technology? Because I'm sure there was a period of time when just getting a closed circuit, like you said, a closed circuit security system was just too expensive. Like I couldn't afford it. So I, I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't, like you said, order a guy to come run line through my entire building mm-hmm. to make sure I had this. And like you said, we, we do see more and more things with cameras. I was thinking about how like in neighborhoods, we notice, like on our, if for anyone who's at lives in a neighborhood, if you go on your next door, like ring cameras or people's personal home cameras are literally being used to help stop, mm. you know, like even petty crime in the neighborhood. Like if some of it's getting ridiculous, like whose dog pooped on my yard? Oh, I see this. Yeah. <laughs> like the, we we see that, but like give us an idea of how cost structures have changed in this industry and what that's unlocking. Because you mentioned. Because that's a great that's a great case that that you know in the event of an abduction, well, it's all about speed. How fast can you recognize per, the perp from going from A to B? The sooner you can spot them and identify them, the more likely you're going to catch them and protect the person. That makes total sense. But in order to do that, there also must be cameras just kind of everywhere. And the more there mm-hmm. are, the more quickly they'll be spotted. Um, very similar to like wow, I've been to London before, where it feels like you can't go 25 feet without seeing a camera. Give us an idea of like how the cost structures have changed for this type of surveillance, leveraging internet systems, because I was thinking about like, that's probably, well, that was one of the biggest limiters, right? It's just the sheer cost and it seems to be going away. No, it's, it's a great question. I think there's a couple of things to think about here. First of all, if you compare with, if you go back 20, 15 years ago, when most cameras were still being analog, you install one camera, you have to pull a coax coaxial cable through a building, which is kind of expensive as a point to point. And the only thing you get is a relatively blurry picture that is not very light sensitive. So at night, you wouldn't really see anything versus today. I'm looking out at the corner of a building here. And of course, we have some security cameras around. You have what we call a multi-sensor camera, 360 cameras that can look at all the 270 degrees around the corner with just one, one up network drop that you have to pull. To that location but probably have a closet uh, mdu closet somewhere close by that you just plug into and then you have it available and it sees in all three directions from the corner and it's light sensitive so you can see at night so of course the value is much much greater than the old cameras were and probably the cost especially of installing it as well one thing that um 
there was a little bit of a drive in the industry to kind of lower the cost, lower the cost, lower the cost. But one thing that a lot of people forget about, one of the bigger costs for a security camera is the actual installation, especially in a high cost country like the US here, mm. where someone still needs to pull a camera, get a chair picker up, mount it on the corner of the building. And then, so the value of it lasting and being relevant and providing a good picture, not going down for five to seven to 10 years instead of one to three years, is very important as well. So there's still, there's more of a trend back to once you put it up there, make sure you put the best cameras with the best features and the latest firmware up there because we want it to sit there for a long time because it's very expensive to come and replace it all the time. As opposed to a lot of people think about, well, you change out your phone every two or three years, but that's not very painful. You just connect it and the upgrades with the firmware and off you go, right? You don't have to mount it or to get a cherry picker to change your phone out. So that's one thing to think with the cost that, and, and the, the industry is definitely getting back to this. We're looking at the, the um, cost of the whole life cycle of the camera to have it installed over a number of years and make sure it's as functional as possible. But to answer your question, and this is just a reference for some of the retailers and retail stores we work with, were they trying to make them both inviting for their customers as well as secure but also limit the, the, the shrinkage, as they call it, or theft yeah. in the stores. And when I started to work in this industry and came here to the U.S. back some 20 years ago, a retail store with a lot of cameras had 30, 40 cameras. Today they have 300, right? So it's really the prevalence of cameras is much, much bigger. And a big system back then used to be 25 cameras. Now there are some customers with you know, 100,000 cameras in, in one in, system. In one right? building? Not in one building, but across gotcha. companies that have big data centers and so forth, or big retailers. I mean, there's no limit to the number of cameras. Uh, because as you said, the more angles, and, and this is a fun challenge. I don't know how many cameras you have in your home, but I remember when I did my first install, you know, after convincing my wife, this is a great idea to have some cameras at home. It's like, it's just a couple of cameras are gonna see everything in the home. And then you install four or five cameras and you realize you see only 10% of the house because there's so <laughs> many angles around. So you need a lot more if you wanna have as you mentioned, full coverage and follow what pe what really happened and what is happening in, in a building. And that's what people are realizing. And with the systems of today, there is so much more scalable. You can do many more smart things. So they actually keep on adding more and more cameras to those systems as well because it benefits the operation. Yeah. I'm curious about how you guys think about signal to no signal to noise ratios because you know with all these cameras and it's the same problem that used to exist with um the old way of me watching a monitor bank of 32,000 monitors and 32,000 cameras which is the reality is 99% of the time nothing's happening nothing of note is happening so how do you guys think about making it clear that something is amiss something is wrong something needs attention how do you guys focus on that because like you said, a person can't really watch no. that much footage and spot anything, really. <laughs> and, and, and the industry used to say that 99% of the video is thrown away or erased. And when they say erased, it was really erased because it used to be VCR tapes that put yeah. it in and then it was erased <laughs> over, which meant the quality got worse and worse and worse all the time as well. Yeah. But, and, and when I say 99%, I think it's probably 99.9%, .9%, at least today, that's just been thrown away and no one ever watches. It's just there for, for a backup. Yeah. But that's really when the the analytics come in and doing intelligent things and detecting video and detecting objects and which direction they're going into so when you want to you don't typically know what you're going to look for but if you're in a building and you're looking for a woman with a, a red blouse you can just punch it into the system it's like can i look at people with a red blouse that worked from left to right sometimes throughout the day and then you can quickly detect who it was and where it was in the past especially with the VCR days, you have to kind of wind through the tape and look at fast forward. You can just imagine the accuracy of doing that. So we really come a long way compared to those systems. Uh, but there, there will be more video, there will be more cameras, longer retention, higher resolution, that, because that's just a trend of technology. So that means that the value of those analytics will become greater and greater and greater all the time, because otherwise it's unsustainable to try to find anything. Yeah. You mentioned, you know, one of the things I wanted to clarify for audiences. Um, so access, you guys focus on the software. Do you guys focus on the hardware of the cameras too, or can any camera be hooked up to like your system? 
So good question. So our main business is the cameras, the IP based cameras, of which we have a wide, wide array, anything from fixed cameras to multi sensor to pantil zooms to all kind of cameras. And of course, the biggest value in those cameras is our software. We develop our own chipsets called the ArtPack. We're on version eight right now. And then we run our own software, which does all those cool things I said before with Lightfinder yeah. and ZipStream for compression uh, and kind of provide an well-documented API so you can integrate it to any software system you want. Uh, and we have thousands of partners doing different kinds of software where they want to integrate uh, video surveillance video from, from pure video surveillance system to access control to facility management system to operational systems. Then we also have our own uh, video management solution as well that integrated and uh, that we have all this feature I talk about with forensic search and, and things like that. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, because I didn't know if it was just a software layer, a physical hardware layer, but it sounds like it optimizes for one, you know, optimizes, obviously, like many things end to end solution, but it sounds like there can be some point plug and play stuff too. the when you think about the future of the business, you know, you guys mentioned it's going to get smarter. It's going to get more capacity as the carriers keep increasing the capacity and the ability to transmit data as camera companies come up with better optical resolutions, as you guys come mm -hmm. up with better AI. What do you think is going to happen over the next five, 10 years? Do you, do you see a place where, you know, like I, I think I think London is a good example for us here in America is like it is you know, they've adopted more security. Like there's definitely a lot of cameras there. I'm sure other nations. I mean, when I was in Taiwan, it was the same thing. I went to Taipei, mm -hmm. some of the more modern buildings, it had less security guards. I'm sure they were there, but there was more like they were using cameras to help keep order. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it is right. And if, if you're nothing to hide, they'll do n n nothing bad to you. And, and typically a security camera is more accurate than a guard who sits there and watch and say, yeah, I saw a guy come through. I think he had a slightly Swedish accent and a blue shirt. There might have been a green shirt. I don't know, but the camera does catch that. But if you look at from the perspective of the end customers and we in the professional video surveillance market, you mentioned the ring cameras before, yeah. that's more kind of the residential side, which is of course a, a, a big area as well yeah. and, and slightly different application. But if you look at the large business to business type application, and this is just America's numbers and, and you can relate them to the world as well. Our end customer, which is schools, retail stores, banks, uh, commercial buildings, uh, transportation agencies, governments, airports, all those kind of things, spend $60 billion a year of making their operations secure. So then you ask yourself, how are those monies being spent? And 80% yeah. of those 60 billion is being spent on human labor, guards, design services, installation service, maintenance service for the equipment and so forth. And I think that's the biggest opportunity to provide even more value to the to the industry, because as we mentioned before, it's really hard for a guard to cover more than a certain area in one reception, but a couple of cameras can do it more effectively. And then you have a remote person who can kind of talk to people that come to building and cover more buildings than just sitting in, in, in one specific building. So one of the bigger opportunities is to automate more and more of that and make it more and more accurate and provide better and better security and safety for all those applications that I mentioned before. And I think that's the really where the market is developing from the deterrence to the forensics to more proactive security and surveillance by just like any other industry, uh, automating more things and making them more reliable and getting the human labor out of it as well. So they can go on and do more meaningful things for the whole society than sitting in the reception, looking people in the eyes and looking. I mean, I, I was traveling just on Sunday, coming back from Europe and you have people in, um, in passport control. So they look at your passport, they look at you and you might yeah. have grown a beard since or added glasses and they need to figure out if it's you or not. While when I came in here to the US, I have this global entry. I just stand in front of the machine. I show nothing. And then it comes out, welcome back, Frederick, with a slip. They detect me, they know what is going on. And that's probably a lot more accurate than a human trying to compare if you are the, the right person. So in that, that's a great application of automating things, make it better and more secure, and, and kind of moving, moving the whole industry forward. Uh, as a global country uh, entry customer, I know exactly what you're talking about. It's always a shorter line. Highly recommend if anyone, if you out, if you have the means to do it, 
I suggest you do for anyone out this international traveler. It's a de wholly yeah. different experience. You know, Frederick, yeah. I agree with you 100% because I think back to back, you know, when I was in enterprise software sales, going to different business to business, you know, going to New York, going to Chicago, going, every building I went to, same thing, right? I had to show up to the front mm -hmm. door, security guard would check me in. I would like fill out a notebook. Like, <laughs> Yeah, I would hand right into a notebook, and yeah. it was just and it might like your driver's license. Might not sure. Yeah. Yes, and like they would call up and it's like, "Hey, are you expecting this person? This person, you know?" They would but just buzz you in, but it was a process. And typically in those lobbies, like especially in New York, you probably remember those days where it's like a big line. There's like a line of people oh. trying to get processed to enter, and like we said, ninety nine point nine percent of people probably. Are, are there with great intentions. It's probably more than that. You know, 99.9, .9, let's call it that. Yeah. But it'd be so much easier if there was a visual identifier that, you know, then says, oh, this is Albert. So, so today what you can do, and we're we're also in the um, access control and intercom business, uh, the person who's expecting you could send to your cell phone, which most likely you are holding on to and you are the only one to have the code, a temporary um, code that you go up to the door station, which has a video that you scan this OCR code yeah. And when it's the code is know that you got it temporarily and it's valid for that two hours in the morning and then you can get in automatically super easy and more security as well, because they send it to your phone and it's very likely that you're you're the one holding on and being able to open that phone. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm sure you could also ask for the reciprocating authentication like, hey, you got to show me what you look like. Take a picture of your face right now. Yeah. You know, <laughs> make sure <laughs> so that when so, you show uh, up, so, you're good to go. So I really think that's that's where the industry is kind of or is moving and, and kind of providing more and more value and automating things and make them more secure, which we are very excited about. Listen, I've been to like I said, I don't know where where I don't know where access has the most installs, but I've been to countries where things were more automated. Uh, my favorite place is, uh, if, if for anyone who's ever been, is Singapore. It really feels like you're in the future. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm all for it. I mean, it, it's, and it's a very safe place to be. I'm all for it. I look forward to having more things that we can do with technology. And some of the stories you guys, you've already told about, like, you know, spotting wildfires and things like that, like that is intense. I, I can see that tremendous benefit to society. For sure, for sure. That's all we're here for to kind of make, try to make the society and, and, and the globe a little bit better place with using technology in a responsible way, of course. There you go. Frederick, thanks for joining us today on IT Visionaries. Albert, great to be here. Thanks for having me.